urban life interested me so that I dared to knock at the door of the cosmos. Welcome to the Sumra Archive podcast. Since 2002, Sumra Archive has been an extension of my personal study and sharing those discoveries with others. Our goal is dedicated to preserving the legacy of jazz musician, composer, keyboard pioneer, visionary philosopher, and band leader, Sun Ra, and his group of master musicians, the Sun Ra Orchestra. You can follow us online at facebook.com Sun Ra Archive and explore our library of articles at sunraarchive.blogspot.com. Planet Earth can't even be sufficient without the rain. It doesn't produce rain, you know. Sunshine, it doesn't produce the sun. The wind, it doesn't produce the wind. All planet Earth produces is uh, the dead bodies of humanity. That's its only creation. Everything else comes from outer space, from unknown regions. Humanity's life depends upon the unknown. Knowledge is laughable when attributed to a human being. Our guest today on the Sun Ra Archive podcast is filmmaker Robert Muggy. Robert is an award-winning director with almost 40 films to his filmography. He's now in his fifth decade as a filmmaker. 2020 marks the 40th anniversary of his film, Sun Ra, A Joyful Noise, which was released in 1980. A Joyful Noise is available on Blu-ray and DVD from MVD Visual. In addition to A Joyful Noise, Robert has made many wonderful music documentaries, including films about Gil Scott Heron, Sonny Rollins, Reuben Blades, Robert Johnson, the music of Hawaii, the music of Zydeco, the blues, that are all worth worth seeking out if you're a film fan and a music fan. It was my hope that in speaking with Robert, we could cover some new territory about a joyful noise. He's given many interviews on the subject over the years, which can be found on his website, robertmuggy.com. In addition to that new ground, I always hope that in speaking with the creators, that we can go deeper into their work and talk about their perspectives, what inspires them, and the process that goes into making the art that we love. So with that in mind, we're going to go deep here, and I'd like to express my gratitude to Robert for being so generous with his time. Enjoy. When the world was in darkness, And darkness was ignorance, along came wrong. When the world was in darkness, and darkness was ignorance, along came wrong. I have many names, names of mystery, names of splendor, names of shame. I have many names. Some call me Mr. Ra. Others call me Mystery. You can call me Mr. Mystery. I'd like to welcome filmmaker Robert Muggy to the Sun Ra Archive podcast. Welcome, Robert. I appreciate you making the time to speak with me and a sincere thanks for all of your wonderful work as a filmmaker. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me, as they always say on cable news. It's an honor to talk to you. It's interesting in, in kind of getting ready to speak, kind of thinking about my relationship uh, with your film, Sun Ra, A Joyful Noise. I first saw it almost 30 years ago now 
and I'm approximating on the conservative side that over those years, I've probably seen it about 50 times. I figure I watch it twice a year and have for the last 30 years. So I think it's it's a real testament, not only to that particular film, but to your skill as a filmmaker that you were able to create something that has such lasting value. And this year is the 40th anniversary of the release right. of Joyful Noise, and that after 40 years, it still stands as the definitive Sunra documentary. Well, thank you. And it is interesting to think about the fact that it's the one film I made with essentially no money. You know, I had made my films on uh, composer George Crumb and then uh, Mayor Frank Rizzo of Philadelphia. I was living in Philly at the time. I had first seen Sun Ra at the 1972 Ann Arbor Blues and Jazz Festival and just was so blown away, more blown away than I was even by the extraordinary Miles Davis at the same festival, uh, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, Bonnie Ray, Junior Walker and the All-Stars, so many other people. But Sun Ra, just somehow he just got under my skin and I just swore that I had to make a film about him. And the following year, 73, I had graduated from UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and moved to Philadelphia to attend Temple University, got there and found out, oh my God, Sun Ra and his orchestra are based here in Philly now. And I had known they were in New York before and in Chicago before that, but uh, had apparently been for for a few years in Philly and many of them living, as you know, in uh, in a house in the Germantown section owned by Marshall Allen's father, approximately uh, seven of them at the time, I believe, six or seven, and just swore, okay, I've got to find a way to do this. I did a year of grad school at Temple University, but it wasn't until um, 1978, after having made those other two films, the George Crumb film and the Frank Rizzo film, that I just decided I have to do this however I do it. And I had some, some uh, a little bit of money from selling the Rizzo film to Swedish television. And so I used that to buy film stock. I got all the, fr- it's like for anyone old enough to remember these things, there used to be these, uh, Um, Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland musicals, you know, and hey gang, let's put on a musical. And so it was basically, or the other example would be like Tom Sawyer convincing his friends to uh, whitewash the fence for him and telling him how much fun it was when really it was uh, something his uh, grandmother or something had assigned him to do. But so I got all these friends to come in with their skills and their equipment and over the next So that was starting in mid-78, and then I got it edited relatively quickly, but then it wasn't until 1980 that someone came in with some completion money, thank God. And now, all these years later, that little film that I made for essentially no money is just in constant demand around the world. This weekend, I I guess, it's um, playing in Greece I just got a couple days ago approached by uh, an African film festival in Tel Aviv, Israel, wanting to show it in November. I mean, it's just remarkable. You know, it has in recent years, I've been asked for screenings in um, Brazil, Australia, you know, multiple times, UK, Ireland, um, France, uh, you know, sometimes theaters, sometimes museums, just as we had all hoped, you know, Sun Ra's legacy is alive and strong. And a lot of people are using this film to help remember what it was like when he was still around, which pleases me a great deal. Mythology, astro, timeless, immortality, astro thought, in mystic sound, astro black of outer space, astro natural, darkness dark, astro reach beyond the stars, how to endless, endless Astro Black Cosmo Earth. The universe is in my voice. The universe speaks through this song to those of Earth and of the world. Listen while you have the chance. Find your place among the stars. Melody, horizon speed, 
Astro Black and Cosmo Dog. Astro Black and Cosmo Dog. Astro Black and Cosmo Dog. You know, the strength of the film from my perspective is that despite the fact that it was your fourth film and you refer to making it with no budget, it's very meticulously captured and constructed. And what it manages to do in its running time is really touch on everything that's important to convey about Sun Ra and his personality, his philosophy, his spirituality, his music, his extended community of musicians, his extended community that he was living in at the time. And not only is it a great primer for people new to Sun Ra, but in that all-encompassing presentation, it provides so much for people like me to constantly refer to and it contains so many iconic scenes and so many iconic quotes for Sun Ra the film delivers on all levels. Well thank you it's certainly the goal was that I would facilitate Sun Ra in saying what he had to say and showing what he had to show presenting his ideas presenting his music and you know if I were making the film today you know it would probably go a lot longer it would have more what we might call production value. There'd be more money behind it, hopefully, and all that. But I just felt so fortunate to get to present what I had experienced from him to others. Let's see, I was 28 when we started the film and full of still, not that I feel I've lost it, but, you know, youthful idealism and lots of ideas about what I thought a film should be, could be. And I'd been influenced by the ideas of some people like a guy named Slavko Vorkopic, uh, a number of friends and, and I from film school. We go from Philly every week down to the American Film Institute Theater at the Kennedy Center in D.C., during a gas shortage, which I have so many stories about the challenge of making it, having enough gas to make it there and back every week. But this guy, Slavko Vorkopic, had created, he had started out as an experimental filmmaker in 1930s films in Hollywood. He created some of the greatest montage sequences. And so he had all these theories about the visual language for storytelling and everything. And so I learned so much from him. And I read a book by a guy named Noel Birch called Theory of Film Practice, who took the techniques of people like Jean-Luc Godard and Robert Brasson and Ozu and Kurosawa and just so many great world directors and sort of said, this is how you can not just tell a story, but do it in ways that are unique to the film medium. And then I was blessed to have um, one of my closest friends from film school, uh, Larry McConkie, who over the last decades has gone on to be probably the top Steadicam operator in Hollywood. Steadicam, of course, being this device that you put over your body and it holds the camera and allows it to float freely as you're walking or running or whatever and can get dolly-like shots, but just by walking with the camera on this device. But Larry, before he started doing Steadicam, which he did right around the time we made Black Wax with Gil Scott Heron in 1982, he was already known as the human dolly because he could he could move. He had this thing with his feet and his legs where he could hold the camera on his shoulder and then move so, so smoothly that the camera wouldn't shake. And so we had already worked together on the George Crumb film and the, the Frank Rizzo film. But so when the Sun Ra film came along, I said, we're going to take advantage of your skills, Larry, and of a lot of the techniques that I want to explore. And we're going to try to find visual equivalents to what the orchestra is doing in audio terms, so in musical terms. So in the concert, when you see these two cameramen obviously doing handheld camera and they're like swooping in it and, and the orchestra's going berserk with all sorts of wonderful atonal shrieking saxophones over top of each other and keyboard and everything and the cameras come sweeping in or out or and across and they they go in and out of focus and and all these 
this was specifically what I had asked them to do because I wanted them to improvise along the same lines that the musicians were improvising. And of course, I wanted to bring the two polar areas of the Sun Ra mythology, you know, outer space and uh, ancient Egypt. So we went to what was then called the University Museum at the University of Pennsylvania. And I thought this, you know, I hate to just plop somebody down on a sofa and have them talk. So we wanted Sun Ra talking in lots of interesting places. So one of the places we took him so that he could address the parts of his mythology that fit well there, we took him to the to the Egyptian room at the University Museum and walked him around ancient Egyptian columns and the sphinxes. And rather than, and of course, they were built so that the sun would light them from above, but we lit them from below, which created an eerie sort of feeling. And then I had Sun Ra walk among these things. And I had Larry with his handheld camera working jazz-like in relation to both Sun Ra and the Sphinx or whatever he happened to be around at the time. And we posed him next to the angel uh, sculptures along the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia and sat him down below them and then looked sort of sideways at them together or upwards at them with him seeming to walk in between and use that as the place to deliver his poetry. And of course, there were other times where like he was just about to enter his house and I just had Larry twirl around him as he's talking about his music being as free as the birds and all these things. So yes, there were definite sorts of techniques I was trying to to bring to bear on this. At the same time, though, I did not want a bunch of special effects. I didn't think a bunch of special effects, even if I could afford much in the way of that sort of thing, were necessary because the images with them and their outfits, their outer space and ancient Egypt related outfits and the dancers and and the lighting often in, in concert and the interesting backgrounds at the house, it was already s- so strong, it would have been redundant to like add some sort of jazzy uh, jazzy effects to it. And, you know, I was partly going on an idea of um, filmmaker Lenny Riefenstahl, who uh, unfortunately cooperated with Adolf Hitler and made the Olympiad film for him and also The Triumph of the Will. Aside from that, she was a well, well-respected filmmaker. And many years ago, I guess around the time I was in, in uh, university, I, I read an interview with her and she said something I found very interesting, which is that picture and sound together should never add up to more than 100%. So she said, like, if you've got this really strong sound, let's call that 70%. You don't want 70% of picture, you want 30% of picture, or vice versa. You don't want to overwhelm, you want everything to blend. I sort of took that to heart. So that too kind of governed our approach was to utilize a certain kind of simplicity that would draw you not so much to our techniques, but to the film's content, to what Sun Ra was trying to show and say, but still doing it with, you know, camera techniques and so forth that we felt lent themselves in a special way to the nature of his own aesthetics. That's fascinating. And it's wonderful to hear because my impression of the film is that kind of natural approach to letting the subject do what it does, not relying on special effects, helps to give it the timeless quality that it has. Obviously, there are cues to geographic locations and fashion that place it in a certain time frame, but there's really no stylistic imprint in the filmmaking that necessarily ties it to an era. Yeah, only on that simpler basis that I'm talking about. We're trying to have a style, but not one that interferes with the content. It's absolutely complementary to the intention of the content, and, and therefore all of that meticulousness in the approach to the camera work and the setup of the shots and the editing to the viewer ends up becoming or can become transparent if you choose to just let the story take you. Another thing we tried to do, which I've tried to do with all my 
my music related films is uh, in performance. I always see it as telling a story. The song itself tells a story. It tells a story that has been written and that is with jazz. It's now being improvised. There's a story going on between the musicians and the audience, their interaction. There's a story going on among the musicians. And implicitly, there's a story going on between our cameras and the people we're filming. So one of the things that I try to do is, well, obviously, whenever I can, I want to, if someone's soloing, I want to be on them at least part of the time. Or if there's an interaction between, like, say, Sun Ra and the horn players, I want to be at Sun Ra's side seeing the horn players in the distance or something. Or, like, on the uh, on the roof, when Sun Ra starts playing the synthesizer and, you know, it's calling planet Earth, calling planet Earth and all that, and then making these wonderful squealing sounds from the keyboard. You know, we don't just show Sun Ra doing that. Uh, I'm at Larry's ear telling him, okay, there's two guys, two guys uh, watching him to his left. Pan to them, then pan back. And over there, there's Marshall and all the other guys, and they're responding in their own ways. They're like gesturing upwards, or they're just listening intently and everything. Let's, as part of the story we're telling, let's show the fascination with which his musicians, his followers, follow his every move, his every note, his every gesture, which is really important because he would never tell them in advance what they were going to play. And so they had to be there for rehearsals a lot, they had to learn all the material, and they had to deduce from the opening notes each time what was going to be played next and know how they were supposed to be, um, you know, responding in terms of his basic arrangements and then whatever improvisation was built into them. <laughs> you prepare for being able to have that directorial vision. So when you filmed Sun Ra and the band in 78, there was very little recorded film or video of the orchestra. Had you seen Space is the Place? Do you seen any videos before you started your film? I can't remember when he and the orchestra were, were on Saturday Night Live. That was 78. Okay, then I, I probably saw that while we were doing this. It didn't tell me anything really. It was just fun to get to see. And to also know that he continued playing at the end of the show. He refused to stop. So they finally just had to cut the end of the program. But I had been to many concerts by the time we were actually filming. My whole time in Philadelphia, whenever he would perform in Philly or in like nearby Camden, New Jersey or so forth, if I could get there, uh, I would uh, show up. And it really further laid the groundwork for me to do this because not only, you know, was I observing what he did, oh, he, they're going to go into the audience at some point. We have to have our cameras set up in such a way that we can also capture from the audience. Same thing I had to do a few years later with Al Green because I went to a show of his on Broadway with Patti LaBelle, Your Arms Too Short to Box with God, and saw he would run out into the audience. So like when we filmed him at Al Green's church, I didn't just rely on him up with a microphone at the front, we put a separate microphone on him so he wouldn't lose his sound when he take, took off running. And likewise, we had somebody with a with a microphone on a, a boom going uh, with them out into the audience so we could continue to hear them uh, chanting in the midst of the song. So I would go to these shows from time to time. And so not only would I get to observe all these things, absorbing more and more of his music and, you know, you sit there and you think, hmm, I might like to have a camera over here. I might like to have a camera over here. But, you know, some of these concerts, of course, would be almost like gospel extravaganzas. You know, there was such a sense of spirituality in the room. And even
even though there are all these avant-garde jazz techniques on display or older jazz techniques or Afro-Caribbean drums and synthesizer, all, all that, you know, he came out of, of course, the jazz scene in Birmingham, Alabama, and there was also gospel mixed in with that and R&B mixed in with that. And so to a great extent, his shows would be structured much like big gospel or R&B um, presentations. And as they would start going out in the audience, periodically, he would just reach over and grab somebody and hug them. And so at the time, I'm sure it was mostly just because he could see how much I was into it rather than feeling cosmically some special bond from the beginning. But at two different shows, he just reached over and gave me a giant bear hug without ever having met me. And so it just sort of furthered my idea that, okay, yeah, this was meant to be. I got to do this. I love that memory. It makes me smile every time you share it. And I mean, it speaks to the, you know, direct personal impression that the music and the artists can have on you. And just like some of the musicians would call him master and were so devoted, he they learned so much from him. Um, they really considered themselves as like disciples of him. He had a tendency to get other people to be amazed and to want to offer support to what he was doing. And so it's I in that way you could argue I wasn't uh, I wasn't that different. Um, in the beginning, I was a guy coming up to the house in Germantown buying the records that did, were not coming out from the bigger record labels that would sometimes release his stuff. There were things that they had recorded often in Chicago and created their own covers, often with glorious individualized artwork on them. And they were mostly just a few places you could purchase them. One was at the house, another was at, at concerts, and the other was at Third Street Jazz, the independent record store in Philly, on Third Street in Philly, uh, I guess it was just above Market Street, which later became Third Street Jazz and Rock. And they, they started having punk rock and other stuff down in the basement. But uh, they always had this um, just certain place where the wall went back and created this little area off to itself. And for years, they had members of the orchestra would bring vinyl albums and um, they would hang there on the wall and, and you could buy them. But um, I don't know, my experience anyway, you, you got... Like, like some of the coolest covers and things like that by going to the house itself. And it would sometimes be funny because uh, I'd buy something they were pushing and then it turned out it was like a double album that had already been released on uh, Impulse and they had just repackaged it and all. But that was fine. It was a cool cover, so I didn't mind. And if you still have them, they're certainly collector pieces now. That brings up the whole thing of popular culture in America to more serious culture, even if it has a wide following and everything. And too often, and as we know, there's this lowest common denominator, whitewashed mainstream culture and uh, the people like Sun Ra have to have to struggle for attention. And really, that's one of the key things I was doing with the film. It's something I, you know, had started doing with the George Crumb film and went on, have gone on to do with a great many other of my music films, which is wanting to do two key things. Capture what these artists who at that time were not covered by, you know, the corporate music and media machine, you know, they were they were left out of the party or whatever. So it was number one to document what they were doing and have this save for the future after all of us are long gone, hopefully. And then on the other hand, also to promote them now. And um, hopefully, you know, that film accomplished both ends. But that was that was certainly the attention that that dual idea of promoting now and documenting for later for when it won't, will no longer be possible to go see Sun Ra perform in, in, in concert. Yeah, mission accomplished. And, and that's the function that it largely served for me. So when, when I became a fan of the orchestra at 20 years of age, it was 91. And I was only able to see Sun Ra with the band once before he departed. But the person that mentored me in Sun Ra's music and, and actually booked that show, that first show that I saw, your film was one of the the three things that he recommended that I see and hear and read to get into and enjoy Sun Ra. 
And we, you know, I think everybody that's a fan of the music, that's what they continue to do. I mean, it's a touch point for anybody that wants to learn about Sun Ra. That's, if not the first, one of the first places that you send them to is Joyful Noise. And I, and I realize that for many people, the, um, you know, aside from John Swed's book and a million albums uh, as they're available uh, and everything, um, and even little other films like Mystery, Mr. Ra from France and things like that. I realize that space is the place is uh, is a key touchstone for people. Okay, we're going to pick up with a new picture roll. It'll be Den. EF in Pharaoh's Den. Picking up with Sync 09. 09 Sync coming up. Okay. Got it. Oh, okay. well, you go first. Hey. Go ahead. Just say what you know about Sun Ra. Well, Sun Ra is a nice group that uh, I live a few doors away from Sun Ra. Is a nice group the uh, players who uh, perform in Sun Ra are nice men because I see them every day. And Sun Ra's music is good music. And when I'm on the store and they be into like the space and things like that, then they are right people. And that's about uh, all I can say right now. <laughs> Come on. Right, yeah. You know something about I don't live around here. Keep you knowing about somebody. No, I don't. Nope. Well, that's it. Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And I do have my Space is the Place story as well. I had bought the album when it first came out on Impulse and just loved it. And of course, the version he played on there was different than I ever heard him play it in concert. It was sort of a more driving kind of version. Uh, it wasn't as sort of laid back and all over the place as in the best way that it could sometimes be in concert. But, you know, I always wondered, why hasn't this film come out? Why hasn't this film come out? And so then several years later, I guess it's 78, 79, you know, I've, I've done my first edit of the film. I know I'm going to have to find a way to be able to, to shoot more later, but Sun Ra and a few of his musicians come over one night, which was a little tricky because, you know, I was living next to the Italian market in South Philadelphia at the time, which uh, was actually kind of risky in the years before that because I was making my film about Frank Rizzo called Amateur Night at City Hall, the story of Frank L. Rizzo, which, though it tried to be somewhat fair, it was pretty negative. But the thing about those sections of Philadelphia down there where I was briefly living is sort of after dark, there's sort of the white neighborhoods and there's the black neighborhoods. At least there were at the time during those troublesome Frank Rizzo years with all the police terror and everything. So this one night, the uh, I was I was living in a corner apartment at 10th and Montrose uh, on the second and third floor. And um, Sun Ron, a couple of the musicians, um, drove into the neighborhood and all of a sudden you know, all these um, nice, but basically racist Italian American folks on their lawn chairs and on the street in front of their um, row houses, urban row houses are just getting kind of alarmed. Who are these guys? So I saw them at the window and I ran out and just hide everybody, you know, just sort of calm them down. Everything's good and bring my friends inside. And so then we um, we went, in, went on to watch the film together on uh, this, uh, what was called a flatbed editing table, 60 millimeter, millimeter editing editing table where you put the film rolls on, they, they go through and you see the picture on a TV-like screen in front of you, though, you know, film, not video at that time. And so the guys just had the greatest time watching it. I think they were really pleased it was turning out as well as it was. You know, who knows? There's this kid who's coming up wanting to make a film about him. And one of the really fun parts of that, too, was uh, every so often in the film, of course, Sun Ra would come out with some um, sort of ancient Egypt outer space mythological wisdom and always delivered in the most serious way. And then at the end of each of these, Sun Ra and the guys would all break out laughing. And it was then that I realized that even though these were serious, intricate myths that he had devised and that that had real messages for people about art, about race relations, about um, mortality versus immortality, all these things, that still they all knew there was a level of jive to the way we're the way Sun Ra was presenting these. So um, anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was like we were all in on a joke together or something. So a joke, even though the seriousness was there as well too. So anyway, we get all the way through it and then Sun Ra says, hey, can we look at this other film now? And I said, sure, what is it? And he said, it's Space is the Place. And he had this uh, 16 millimeter print 
it's not a final print that would have what's called an optical soundtrack on the edge. It had what's called a magnetic track. And magnetic track is something where, where it's like audio tape, magnetic audio tape, old-fashioned tape. And the audio would have been laid right down on, on this stripe of tape. But um, so he said he wanted us to look at it. And then he wanted me to cut out all the parts he hated. And so, well, I feel a little funny, you know, um, messing with somebody else's film but he explained to me that so far he had refused to let them release it and that he had them send him a copy because he was going to tell them what he would accept and what he would not and what it turned out to be of course was that the long version of Space is the Place had both that sci-fi story at the center musical sci-fi center but then it had all kinds of black exploitation elements which Sun Ra felt were kind of a betrayal of what he was trying to do with the film otherwise. You know, this spaceship that makes musical notes and all these things. You know, suddenly it's pimps and hoes in, in the ghetto. And um, so what he had me do is go through and cut out all the black exploitation stuff and we cut it down to around an hour. And then as we're sitting there, I'm not sure if it was the producer or the director, he calls him up and says, okay, we're going to send you uh, uh, what you can release and I got on the phone with him briefly and said you know I'm just doing what Sunrise asked me to do uh, you know th- we're just cutting these out and putting tape splices on to hold them together and so a friend of mine who was my distributor right around that time named Bruce Ricker he's dead now but he had a company called Rhapsody Films Inc which specialized in uh, especially in, in jazz documentaries and so Bruce ended up releasing what I'm pretty sure because it was about an hour long. I'm pretty sure it was that version that, that we cut down. And then a while after Sun Ra died, finally those guys released the full version and now there's the big fancy, I guess it's a Blu-ray box and everything and maybe even has the different versions, I'm not sure. But uh, that's kind of the behind the scenes story on that. I had nothing to do with the making of the film, but Sun Ra sort of brought me in from left field to uh, kind of end up affecting how it was seen for a while, which again was the way he preferred to have it. I just don't want to imply in any way that I had any aesthetic involvement in this film. I just was his eyes and hands at the editing table, just taking out several clumps of material that he did not favor. That it was <laughs> kind of a very ironic uh, <laughs> situation to be in. Which is probably why that role has never been attributed to you. I've never heard that before. That and, story and is that's fine. notorious. <laughs> I think you can go this far and say, okay, I know a lot of people really like the full film and that's fine and maybe even take a sort of camp delight in a lot of the stuff that Sun Ra didn't like and it's great that it's available to people and will continue to be as a historical artifact, but I know firsthand that if you want to see the film as Sun Ra wanted it to be seen, it would be that earlier much shorter cut just around an hour or so absolutely they have two completely different intentions and effects and then the the last part of that story is that after we had done all that we went down back down to the second floor we had been up on the third floor where the little editing room i'd set up and uh so i got some kind of snacks for them and Sun Ra saw my record collection and he saw that I had some early Duke Ellington and some old Fletcher Henderson and um, so I asked if he'd like me to put them on and he said sure and um, well actually I don't think he used a word like sure but he said yes and uh, and so we, we listened to both and it was unbelievable you know the musicians two or three musicians he had brought with him just as, as the music would play Sun Ra would narrate what was happening. Now they're going to this chord. Now they're they're borrowing from this other musician. Now they're doing that. And the musicians would all be hanging there listening to the perfect master explain these basics, which also showed me the extent to which, you know, just as lots of abstract painters, 
to be really good need to have mastered basic representation first. And if you're going to do atonal music, it's good if you understand traditional musical forms first, and then you know what you're playing off of, just the way like Sun Ra might do a song that starts out with very traditional harmony and melody and everything, and then go off into outer space with uh, modal music or whatever, and then he'll come back. It's like making a trip into space and then coming back again. But uh, it was a huge treat for me, and I can't really remember a single thing he said, you know, more than four decades ago, but just, but it was right then I understood that much better. I I thought, why all these talented musicians would, you know, endure a certain amount of poverty uh, when they got sick, wait until uh, out in Abraham, uh, Sun Ra's partner back in Chicago would come up with some money to pay the doctor, or they could do some concerts and get some money in, the sort of constant struggle that anybody who tried in recent decades to operate a big band understands. But when you figure it's also an African-American avant-garde big band, you know, it's just none of us can even imagine the challenges. But anyway, that was a, a very special night for several reasons. I think that's one thing that to date Sun Ra hasn't been given proper credit for as far as educating newer audiences about the importance and value of that big band swing music of Fletcher Henderson, Duke Ellington, etc. in a way that makes it a living, breathing art form and not some quaint relic from the past. I know that there's a whole generation of listeners like myself who truly love that music and, and appreciate it beyond its nostalgia value that can directly attribute that to Sun Ra in a way that, you know, the later big band and swing revivals of the 90s didn't manage to do. So I think you make yeah. a really great point of what a great ambassador of that music that he was to keep it alive. Well, as you say, he put it in a broader context. He said, these are the fundamentals. Look at all these other things we can do working off of those fundamentals, but we're not too proud or too great to come back and play those fundamentals in, in an honest way, in a respectful way. I've run into this, you know, I've made films about a, a lot of musical genres, and it's always so interesting. I'll give you one example, Zydeco. You know, there were the traditional Zydeco artists who played things in a certain way, you know, Clifton Chenier and Buzu Chavis and John Delfos and a whole bunch of others. And then newer generations started taking the music other places and not just mixing R&B with it like Clifton Chenier did, but bringing in funk and uh, later hip hop and all kinds of other things. And similarly, when I did bluegrass film, you know, there were the traditionalists and there were the people creating sort of, they were bringing heavy doses of black gospel into it, uh, even though they always saw it as basically a white music. Uh, the, a lot of the older veterans, they weren't really acknowledging that, hey, the banjo is an African-American instrument based on one they brought over from Africa as slaves. And that a lot of those musicians, like Bill Monroe himself, growing up, were taught by black artists. But um, anyway, you know, a lot of the veterans were looking askance at the newer things, combining bluegrass with jazz and uh, other musical forms. And it was interesting interesting because when I made both of those films the same year, The Kingdom of Zydeco and uh, Gather at the River of Bluegrass Celebration, I had a few years before made a film about uh, Hawaiian dance called Kumuhula Keepers of a Culture. And there's that same dichotomy, that same split in that music where the chant is the word in Hawaiian ancient Hawaiian culture. It's an oral history. And these songs, these chants, 
tell the history of the Hawaiian people. The dances, the hula came about as visual illustrations of those chants. So that's the traditional, the ancient hula. More modern artists want, started wanting to use other musics, you know, Tin Pan Alley, when Hawaiian music, you know, sort of took over the world for a while, brought the steel guitar from Hawaii into country and blues and all that, and had this big influence. And, and then later they brought in reggae and they brought in country western and all these things to the music backing up the dances and then the dances got wilder and wilder. But what they did, I thought was very wise in the Hawaiian culture, is they split it. They said, okay, there's going to now be two traditions. There's going to be one called Kahiko and that you have to do the chants and the dances exactly as they've come down for hundreds and hundreds of years from one kumuhula, which means master teacher, to another, and your authenticity, your integrity are judged by, okay, you're a kumuhula, which one did you learn from? Who did the person before you learn from? And all that back hundreds of years. In fact, you know, all this started in 500 AD when the Hawaiians, uh, the people who settled Hawaii, first arrived there. Now then on the other hand, you have this um, form called awana. And awana means anything else. Anything goes. Any kind of music you want, any kind of dance steps you want, any kind of costumes you want. Just don't try to do that stuff in Kahiko or the musical community, the dance community will make your life a living hell. So I always thought, you know, how nice if we could just, I mean, I, I suppose jazz has that sort of implicit that, okay, some people do Dixieland jazz or jazz of New Orleans, whatever you want to call it. Some people are still into uh, bebop. Uh, some people are into, be into big band jazz and um, sort of everything from John Coltrane and Ornette Coleman and all that. It's much more open and Sun Ra, much more open what you want to try and you either like it or you don't like it, but no one's in his right, his or her right mind is saying you have no right to do what you're doing or anything. So anyway, yes. And Sun Ra didn't really start working the big band material in a major way into his concerts until after the film we made. At a certain point, uh, it got to be where a major part of most concerts were great old big band jazz, or they might be some Disney tunes and fun things like that, but uh, still with enough of the, um, the more mythological, uh, more heavily synthesized sounds, all that. And that was another thing I must say that attracted me to Sun Ra, as it has to a number of other artists over the years, is I love artists who create a new synthesis of some kind and who don't just settle into doing what everyone has done before, but says, okay, I'll take the harmonic structure from there. I'll take um, this new Moog synthesizer invention. I'll take these drums, uh, Afro-Caribbean drums, I'll take ideas from a number of philosophical systems. I'll take the idea of Africa as a black advanced civilization that has influenced the world and doesn't properly get it its due. And I'll take in a sort of a fun sci-fi B-movie kind of way, the way that's sort of easiest to express without a fortune in, in machines for light shows and all these things. I'll sort of open up that idea idea of limitless possibility through the sci-fi um, references. And through it all, I will create a mythology that talks about the value of African-American men and women that says, okay, you're going to try to, as Sun Ra says in the film, limit me. You're going to try to brand me as one thing, something that you see as very limited, as having no ambition to it. You're going to label me in this way and have my rights uh, follow. So we'll forget it. I'm creating my own larger identity for myself and others. And it goes beyond this moment in time, beyond this geographical uh, location, I'm daring to dream about what my people can be and already are. I'm redefining it through this mythology. And, you know, he always expressed these things in wonderfully poetic ways, but I think that was a key part of what was happening there. That and a sort of a gospel-like notion of spirituality and everything. And I never was at a Sun Ra concert where the room didn't just 
fill with what I could only define as spirituality, much like going to a great gospel concert or something. And not unlike the Al Green um, gospel performances I filmed at his church, uh, you know, a few years later. can't help but reflect on the time that we sit in right now, that the power of the message and the power of your film and how it captures that or how it remains constantly relevant and in some ways, I think, more relevant as time goes on because it's such a unique viewpoint that becomes, I think, societally more and more valuable about this idea of a self-directed place in the world that is elevated above any norms of society or convention or labeling, just a true honoring of the individual spirit and kind of self-determinism. And there are so many quotes within the film that constantly play back in my mind when I am watching the news or reading a book. They seem to gather power as, as time goes on or relevance as time goes on. And I think that is a real tribute to the enduring aesthetic message, the philosophical message and aesthetic creations of Sun Ra and those around him. And yes, in the film, Sun Ra did bring the politics down to earth for a time. And when I took him to D.C. and what he had wanted me to do there didn't work out, which was supposed to be a, um, a cutting contest between himself and another guy who, uh, who said that he was the representative of the creator of the universe. Uh, Sun Ra didn't like hearing there was competition, so he wanted to go find this guy and we spent <laughs> hours looking for him. We never did find him, so I said, well, Sun Ra, I've got all this crew down here from Philly down to D.C. Uh, we got to get something out of this trip. And I said, how about we go sit in front of the White House? So we sat him down, and he took it from there and, of course, said, I'm sitting here in front of the White House. I'm looking across the street, and I don't see the Black House, which is where it should be. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out what he's saying, that the American government, the American society needs to be responsive to all its citizens, not just people of one race or one social group or one geographical area or anything else. And he also goes on to talk about in his poetic way, you know, he says there's this man from the Ku Klux Klan who says, 
the black people have contributed as much to Western civilization as to the horse. And he says, I think I can contribute more than the horse. Then, then he takes it out into the mystic again. And he says, of course, we're, none of us are here very long anyway. And then we go out into outer space. and We're not sure where and all that. The interesting thing, too, though, of course, um, you know, in my Rizzo film and then in the Sun Ra film, we did deal with racism in various ways and, uh, you know, heavily on the police brutality and everything in the Rizzo film. And uh, then with my next film, we went whole hog because it was, uh, you know, Gil Scott Heron. So, you know, in song after song and poem after poem, Gil Scott Heron talks about police brutality and even brings up Frank Rizzo. And uh, he talks about what's done to immigrants. And uh, he... uh, uh, he talks about the lack of attention to like the Harlem Renaissance and the great achievements of uh, African Americans. You know, that story is notorious how Sun Ra exerted control over another filmmaker's film and basically held up the release of it. Did you have any experiences like that with Sun Ra where he tried to inform or give opinion about your directorial vision and how the film was made? Sun Ra and I overall had a wonderful relationship in the making of this film. And I think in large part, that's because he got to understand that I was not there to impose my own vision separate from how I interpreted his vision. That I was there to be a facilitator, that I was there to help him tell his story. In the process, I was telling a story as well. I was allowing, to a great extent, him to use me as his instrument, just as I did with Gil Scott Heron and Ruben Blades and others. I'm telling my story, we're collaborating on what will be told. I'm picking out techniques to use from my end, but it's his story and he never felt the need like looking at something I'd shot and edited or anything. He never said, oh, I don't like that. I want that out. No, he embraced it all. However, I will say that my lack of finance for most of the project did lead to frustration because as I say, Sun Ra and the orchestra were always short of money. They had really legitimate needs, you know, food, uh, medicine, travel expenses, rent, utilities, you know, and sometimes they could get out and do enough concerts to keep the money coming in. Sometimes Alton Abraham could send them money from record deals or whatever because he basically, you know, ran the business side of things for Sun Ra, but no, they need needed money. And so it actually led to a number of scenes that are a little bit amusing in retrospect, as uh, traumatic as they were at the time. When I first came to Sun Ra wanting to make the film, I said, gee, I'd like to do this if you don't mind. And I said, I don't have any money now, but if I can get some footage in the can, I'm hopeful I can use that to raise the money to complete it and everything. So he said, well, he was sort of noncommittal, but he said, you know, this is at his home in Germantown. We're going to be doing a a concert coming up somewhere. I have the exact date of it, but it was in the summer of uh, 78. And it was at the Left Bank Jazz Society concert series in downtown um, Baltimore. And he said, if you and your crew want to show up, we might let you film. So of course I have to get all these friends and acquaintances with equipment and all that and say, well, hey, we're all driving to Baltimore and we're praying he will let us film. So we show up. I had called ahead to the Left Bank Jazz Society in advance. They were extremely welcoming. In fact, that's one of the fun things is that each in their own way, Philadelphia and Baltimore each claim this film because they each feel they had a significant part in it, which they did. You could even say DC had a little bit of a claim to it as well. So we go to 
down there and it turns out they're fixing fried chicken dinners for everybody and they agree to for a token amount to feed our crew and you know starting with the next film I was almost never without a multi-track recording truck but I didn't have that kind of money on this occasion and my usual sound man wasn't available so I had another one and he wasn't turned out quite as well set up for recording stuff as uh, we would have liked and there was a, a board for the PA with mixing going on so if we if he had brought the right cable we could have plugged right in but he didn't so what we ended up having to do he had a small mixer and multiple microphones so we he sat a couple microphones up in front of the band and you know you, you need to hear this in the context of when properly done properly placed with an overhead microphone you know in the past some great recordings of symphony orchestras have done with a single mic so right. it's not that it's not possible to do you don't have to mic the hell out of everything there are ways to do it and we more or less did there so we had a few mic set up then he put a, bo- a mic up on a boom into the air and got the mix that was coming out of the PA system so we were able to get a general mix in that way but then emphasize whatever we wanted to, to point mics at that the cameras were also going to so it was a pretty simple process and thank god it worked as well as it did we left out from the film a lot of the stuff where it didn't of course so I along with my main cameraman Larry McConkie and my old friend Dave Ensley that I'd gone to UMBC with and then Dave got a friend of his, Chris Lee, who's been with me on every almost every film I've made since then. So we had three cameras and we had this sort of um, minimal audio recording. And so we managed to get through, I guess it was three hour concert, something like that. And we had had our uh, film stock, all these boxes of expensive film stock. The one thing I had put money into, you know, because they'd be like a hundred bucks a piece for 10 minutes of film for one camera. And, you know, we're shooting with multiple cameras. Um, the whole night and so over the course of the evening I was told that some of the films started disappearing and of course Sun Ra was known for shooting things like at the pyramids or just some other places he liked to do little 16 millimeter shooting and then show the stuff at concerts and stuff so I didn't begrudge him we did have enough to uh, shoot everything that night then the concert ends suddenly you know I have my crew breaking down we're all relieved everything had gone pretty well we're soon going to be driving back to Philadelphia All of a sudden, I find members of the orchestra creating a circle around me. And I said, hey, what's up, guys? They said, Sun Ra wants to talk to you. Wait here. And there was no choice because they made this circle around me. So finally, Sun Ra comes up. And basically, his message, it was Sun Ra when he talks to you. It's always very elaborate. But the basic message with some of the actual words was, because of 400 years of racism, I'm in charge now. And I want the tape. And so at first I thought he meant the film stock and I kept saying, why, Sinra, what, what, why do you want that? And how am I supposed to finish the film with, or even cut stuff together so I can go raise some money? And I slowly realized he didn't mean the film. He meant the audio tapes the quarter inch magnetic tape onto which all his music was going. He didn't care how they looked. He cared how they sounded. And so we finally reached a compromise, which was that the audio guy and I would, as we left there, drive to the house in Germantown, meet him there, and we would listen to the tapes together on his uh, recorder. So we sat down with Sun Ra and uh, we're listening, we're listening, and I'm actually cringing because some of the sound wasn't as good as it should have been because we didn't have mics on everything we should have. Other parts sounded really good, but Sunra didn't seem to notice, and the reason he didn't notice was every so often his head would go down and he would have a 15-minute cat nap. And the humor of this is that Sunra had always claimed that he never slept, that he was immortal, and he never slept. So... <laughs> I realized that what was happening here was what I have heard other people do who claim they don't sleep. Because it is, I think, physically impossible to get no sleep at all. You'll die. What they do is they take occasional cat naps. So he would, we'd be listening. He'd zone out, fall asleep for 15 minutes, his head down on his chest. He'd come back up and he'd say, okay, that was good. Let's hear the next one. So I think partly because of that, we escaped by the skin of our teeth. However, there was this other guy who 
came there too, a guy, um, I think it's Evidence Records, the guy who owned Evidence Records, which was a new label at the time and was preparing to put out a new album from Sun Ra. Right, Jerry Gordon. I think that's who it was. I think that's who it was. I, I said, I just don't feel comfortable just leaving the tapes with you, Sun Ra. Can we at least have them with a third party? And so Jerry Gordon, I, I believe it was, offered to hold them until we came to an agreement, I came up with some money, whatever. So weeks went by and I finally contacted him. I said, Jerry, listen, I can't raise any money if I can't edit this film together. Can you please give me the tapes? And so reluctantly, he finally did and I was able to start editing the stuff. Call in planet Earth. Call in planet Earth. Call in planet Earth. Call in planet Earth. I am a different order of being. Call in planet Earth. I am a different order of being. I will be coming your way soon. Planet Earth. Call in planet Earth. I will be visiting you soon. On every hill, every dale, every valley, every home, every person, I am a different order of being. I represent a different kind of horizon, another kind of sunrise, another kind of sunset, sunrise, sunset. Same sun is shining that was shining then. I would get on the phone regularly with Sun Ra and we would talk about what could be filmed. I would make some suggestions and slowly he really got into it. He realized I'm not going anywhere. I'm here for the duration and I'm open to his ideas. So he would start saying, let's go film by the angels along the Schuylkill River. Let's go down to Washington and film a cutting. Well, he didn't call it a cutting contest. I, I do it. A, a debate, whatever. Religious debate between him and this other self-anointed religious leader in the black community in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And so between us, by collaborating uh, with mutual respect, sharing our ideas, we really were able to to get, a, as you said earlier, a wide range of views of their lives and art. And, you know, another example is he said, uh, I asked him if they were doing any performances coming up, and he said, well, we're going to be doing this one from this guy who was in the band. Uh, he, he said he just played with them off and on, and he did drugs, and he died of an overdose. But we're going to go uh, to this nightclub in uh, West Philly, and we're going to uh, pay tribute to him. So I said, great. You know, I just had a very tiny crew, but we were able to film that. And it turned out that what he was calling a um, requiem and um, for this musician, and he said, of course, it's the first time one has been wrote for a poor, unfortunate man. In fact, it was one of his classic compositions, but it does have a mournful quality to it. I thought it worked really well in that context. Okay, skip ahead. All that stuff's been shot. I've got that edit. Monday go by, you know, I try public television, I try synthesizer companies like Yamaha, I try anywhere I can. Everybody loves what they're seeing, nobody wants to put up any money. Which is why for most of the 80s I was making films for British television because they were willing to put stuff into films about minority American culture, which nobody much in America was. So I, I finally was getting close on some funding, but I figured I have to have a release from him. I have to have him sign something that says he knows we're doing the film, he approves, he gives us the rights to continue working on it and anticipates, you know, when the time comes, giving us the rights to the music and, and all that. So we arrive at his house in the afternoon. He's chatting with a couple of his musicians, pontificating on something of interest. And so I said, explain. He said, gee, Sanra, you know, I hate to do this, but I really need you to sign something. It doesn't ultimately commit you to anything, but it's an indication of your support. And in Sun Ra's own inimitable way, by which I mean not with anger, not with great emotion, in a logical, matter-of-fact, 
but myth-filled way, he spoke for the next two hours with my not able to get a word in edgewise about why it was impossible for someone who is immortal to create a contract with someone who is mortal. Finally, as he would say these things over and over in different ways, finally, after two hours, I could take it no longer. I made one of the biggest mistakes of my life, which fortunately I got out of shortly afterwards. But I said, Sun Ra, you're going to end up in the graveyard because he had used the word graveyard. Yes. So he said I was going to end up in the graveyard. So how could he, you know, how could an immortal being sign a piece of paper with such a person? I finally said, Sun Ra, you're going to end up in the graveyard just like everybody else. And he was was devastated. He stopped talking for the most part. He looked like a sad child. He, he was crushed. And what he said to me was, how can I work with you if you don't believe the things I tell you? And he was right. And I spent the next half hour profusely apologizing, saying, Sun Ra, I'm so sorry. I got emotional. I was wrong. I didn't mean what I said. I believe that you're immortal. I honor you for that. Please forgive me. And by the time I left, my paper was unsigned, but we were the best of friends again. <laughs> so, and then of course, the other story that relates to those other two, they're sort of like, I can't say bookends. It's a three-part, three-part bookends. When I finally, a friend named Nancy Niebuhr got a friend of hers, a guy named Daniel Kahn, K-A-H-N, from New England, who was well off as a young man, convinced him to come up with $15,000, which today is nothing. But at the time, on a film that had been made without money, was enough for me to complete the film, to make film prints, to do a sound mix. Uh, to do the final printing, color correction, all those things that you do in the, in the completion of a film. And so after I got that money from him, I drove up to see him in Germantown. And uh, I said, Sun Ra, I brought you something to sign again, but I also brought you a check. And Sun Ra's response was, Muggy's got money. Everything's right in the universe. And we got, he signed the piece of paper and we got along famously. And then we went home. Then no sooner did we get there than Sun Ra was on the phone saying the local branch of my bank in Germantown would not cash the check for him. So we had to jump in the car, drive up there, go with Sun Ra and one or two of the artists, go to the local branch and say, this gentleman is named Hermie Sonny blunt alias or aka sun ra i have made the check out to sun ra this gentleman with the modified science fiction and ancient Egyptian outfit on is Sun Ra. You can check your records. This is my bank. This is my check. Please cash it for him here in my presence. And though the guy was reluctant, I think he called to my branch and everything. He finally did it. And it was then that Sun Ra said, could you take us by the grocery store? So we did. And that too was a great joy because here we we had these uh, emissaries from outer space in ancient Egypt with us buying canned goods and potato chips and hot dogs and whatever anybody wanted off the shelves, everybody happy. And then we uh, took them back and I may not have seen them again until a couple premieres of the film. Um, I think it was the Carnegie Hall Cinema in New York, one of the early ones where we showed it. And he and many of the orchestra members did come up from New York to be there, which was a real treat for everybody. But that's right. Actually, the planetary premiere, as you can still see if you look at the original poster from the event, the planetary premiere was at International House in Philadelphia. They had a theater there, and uh, it was on the roof of International House where when I got that additional money, we did an additional concert, an additional performance. There was no real audience. A performance on the rooftop, because I figured that was the closest I was going to get him to space while performing and figured would be much better than just throwing up nonsense planetary effects behind him or whatever. So we had filmed him up there and had my normal sound man, Bill Barth, back. And uh, even though we didn't have a multi-track recording truck and everything. He did have a mixer, a whole bunch of microphones and recorder. And so we were able to get 
far more, even though it was mixed live, it was a far more sophisticated recording than we had gotten at the concert in Baltimore. But uh, yes, the orchestra all came to the planetary premiere in Philadelphia prior to that one in uh, in New York. It was a, a real treat. And in fact, just this past uh, year, I guess it was this past fall, I went and um, the International House, which... International House of Philadelphia is right on the edge of the University of Pennsylvania campus in Philadelphia. And it's where for like, I don't know, a hundred and some years, I think, foreign students would come to live in this big building because a lot of times they couldn't, in this wonderfully um, illiberal country, much of the time they could not find places to live after foreign students after getting accepted to the University of Pennsylvania. And plus, there was a certain gratification for them being among other international students who were also adapting to American ways and all that. So anyway, for all this time, more than a century, I believe, all these students had lived there. But also over time, they got all sorts of cultural events happening out of there, music and poetry. And, and they had this film theater. And over the years that I was living in Philadelphia, many of my films were shown there. And so, as I say, we had the premiere there. And then this past year, it was decided that International House had to close because the international students could now live anywhere they wanted. There really wasn't a need any longer for this big concrete building full of dorm rooms, essentially, and a theater and some cafeteria and stuff. So it was sold. And so they they scheduled a number of final screenings, the film people at iHouse, International House, a few uh, screenings to celebrate the film heritage of the place. And so one of them, they asked me to come show the Sun Ra film. And so we showed it on an outdoor screen just outside the building. And um, I believe the film people from International House have now moved to a university in downtown Philadelphia. But one of the most fun things to know about that concert on the roof was, I believe it was August, and it was 100 degrees out. And of course, up there, there was gravel on the roof, and there were these giant concrete walls on two sides of us, which held like air conditioning units and stuff. And in fact, if you listen during some of the interview up there, you'll hear this kind of a whistling in the background, and it's the air conditioner. But all of that heat pulled back on us after bouncing off the concrete, probably made it a good 120 degrees up there. And a number of the musicians talk about to this day how, you know, some of them were wearing flip-flops and sandals and things like that. They actually started melting from the heat of the surface even as they're playing, but uh, yeah, they endured. What are you going to... Incredible. You know, you, you have a Sun Ra performance, you expect some heat. What can I say? Maybe it added to the heat of the music. It's a I great performance. And yeah. you mentioned reviewing the Left Bank Jazz Society recordings with Sun Ra, and he was well known for utilizing all manner of studio recordings, field recordings, hi-fi, lo-fi for his Saturn releases. Was there ever any discussion on his part to utilize any of your recordings and release them himself? Or was there any thought given to releasing a soundtrack to the film at any point? Uh, not by him. Years later, a friend of mine who had been a major executive at A&M Records and some others and ultimately became second in command of Impulse, you know, years after its heyday. Uh, and they were reviving the catalog and recording some new stuff and all. Well, he left there and he decided he wanted to create an independent music label of his own while going back to school because he decided he wanted to teach. So he wanted to keep his hand in with recording stuff. So he decided it would be fun to release soundtrack albums for a bunch of my films. And a number had already been released over the years 
years, you know, for Deep Blues and Saxophone Colossus and Hawaiian Rainbow and things like that. But so we were made an effort to put a bunch of stuff together, but his plans ultimately fell apart. Then, of course, years later, when I had this opportunity to create a Blu-ray, the current release, Blu-ray and DVD for um, MVD, which originally stood for Music Video Distribution or Distributor, MVD Visual, you know, when nowadays, whenever you can for DVD and Blu-ray, you want bonus materials. So I got out all that audio again, the extended versions of music that's in the film, and also some sections of music that were not in the film. And so I put those on as bonus audio, as I'm sure you know, for that current release. But I should also say something that some of Sun Ra's music recordings from back then were really well recorded in, you know, high-end studios and all. But a lot of stuff was, you sort of alluded to it, I think you call it kind of lo-fi or something. And there'd be a minimum number of microphones and it might be in a house rather than in a studio. And even though there would be sort of a flat quality sometimes or just almost an amateur sense of recording, still there would be, you know, so much charm, so much uh, authenticity. Uh, You didn't care. People collected them anyway because it was rare stuff. And, you know, Sun Ra released hundreds of albums. And if if you want to be anywhere near everything, you've got to make a point of getting all those. But because that had been true of a lot of his recordings. I didn't feel quite as bad that the audio recordings we made at the Left Bank Jazz Society weren't totally polished or anything. You got the gist of what was going on. You could hear Sun Ra fine. You could hear percussion. You could hear the horns. You you got the idea. And would I have loved for it to be perfect? Sure. In fact, starting with my next film, which is the first film I made for Britain's Channel 4 Television, where I had a big budget and music 24 track music recording truck and all that from then on one of my goals was to make the way I covered artists who were outside the mainstream uh, and who didn't uh, get enough respect from corporate television recording studios record labels all that I wanted to be able to try and record them with just as high a production value as it would be if I were doing the Rolling Stones or somebody like that and actually with the Gil Scott Heron film there was a second motivation, which is that, so this was late 70s, of course, when we were doing the bulk of this. And over the decade before, just over a decade, you know, whenever there were political films made, they were usually black and white. They were cinema verite effects, meaning jumpy camera, randomly out of focus footage, you know, not done for an artistic reason, just people constantly zooming in and out and changing the focus and when they zoom in or zoom out. and, And I decided, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give the dog whistle that this is a political film by having ratty looking visuals. I'm going to do the opposite. You know, Bertolt Brecht, the great theater director, writer from Germany back during the Weimar Republic and afterwards, you know, he always talked about aesthetic distancing, that he didn't want people to be sucked into a play, a film, whatever, like it was a dream and just have like an emotional response Uh, he wanted them to be pushed back a little bit so that they would be forced to think about what they were watching. So they would remember they're watching a play, they're watching a film, whatever, and think about the ideas, not just have an emotional experience. While keeping that in mind with the Gil Scott Heron film, I decided to go the other direction. I decided that I was going to make this the smoothest, sweetest looking and sounding political film ever made to do sort of just the opposite of what Bertolt Brecht said, to not allow people to like diminish their feelings for the importance of this film by saying, oh, it's just another one of those raggedy shot political films. But no, we were going to suck people in. Like, oh, this is so pretty. All these flowing Steadicam shots, all this beautiful jazz funk music, really well recorded and mixed and all that. And that we were going to create a different kind of political film that in 
entranced you rather than pushing you away. I felt like, if anything, it would have the same ultimate result. It would draw you into the ideas along with the emotions and so forth. But one of the things I was thinking about, at the time, there was a book out by Erica John called Fear of Flying. It was one of the early feminist books, but heavily centered on human sexuality. And Erica Jong had this notion she loved to talk about in interviews. The notion was of what she called the zipless fuck. And what she meant by that was two people are so caught up in the rapture of the moment that they come together taking off all their clothes on the way without even realizing it. They have so much passion, so much ambition for their bodies to meet midway that they basically just curl off their clothes and that's what she called a zipless fuck and so I would tell people that you know it used to be that one of the slang names for films was flicks so I would tell them that the Gil Scott Heron film was intended to be a zipless flick it's something that would just draw you into it and hopefully give you some of the same uh, passionate pleasure that Erica John was talking about in 1980 when I premiered the Sun Ra film in Philadelphia at International house, I did several interviews. One of them was with Terry Gross of NPR's Fresh Air, which was not yet NPR, it was just WHYY local, as it would be for um, the next six or seven years still. So I ended up actually going, once I went on that first time with the Sun Ra film, I ended up going on every year or two with a new film, and she had a three-hour show back then and loved filling a whole hour with, you know, me talking about the making of the film and then playing of a bunch of the songs. And she referred to what Sun Ra was doing, like in the Egyptian room and all that, as soliloquies. And I thought that was so perfect. And then when we came to do the Gil Scott Heron film a couple years later, I said, well, we're going to do the same thing, but it won't be in an Egyptian room. It'll be wandering around Washington, D.C., talking about how this may be a white federal government here, but it's a black neighborhoods, and talking about the tension between the two, because I had grown up in the D.C. suburb, Silver Spring, Maryland, and and that was something that I wanted Gil to talk about. And Gil was living in, in the D.C. area at the time, so he was great with it. And so I said, we're either going to be walking through those neighborhoods or through the monuments, or since we're shooting your performance at a place called the Wax Museum Nightclub, which used to be the actual D.C. Wax Museum and still has all those wax figures in their giant back room and says we can use them, we're going to build you a set, let you walk through it, give additional soliloquies about America. American history and so forth. So that's sort of how that evolved. It was my not wanting to do traditional interviews in either of those films. And because in the first film with Larry's handheld work and in the second film with Larry's Steadicam work, we had this way to smoothly walk through the city, walk through this set. We spent a day building in that storage area. But uh, yes, Gil loved it and got into the whole notion of it. And even though he had been, it turned out, freebasing cocaine for two years at the time, he still had his wits about him. He still was one of the smartest people I ever met and could improvise incredibly on his feet, you know. And so, you know, he would adapt to material he would use elsewhere, but he would come up with these monologues for, uh, as he walked through these different situations. And then the other thing which made it really special, those kind of going through the city scenes was while we were filming Among the Wax Figures, he said, you know, over the weekend, I was recording some new tracks in the, in the studio. They're just partial tracks. He said, like, for instance, I got this new song called Washington, D.C. And um, he said, I have, you know, a few of the instruments on there. And then I have a very faint guide track, meaning his vocal, but to use as a guide for people to add more tracks to it, more instrumental tracks, um, without him having yet added added his final vote. So he said, so you can just throw this on the soundtrack if you want. And I said, well, that's not typically the way I work. But I said, how about this? Do you have a boom box, something like that? And he said, sure. And I said, tell you what, bring that tomorrow when we go to shoot around the city and we'll make something happen. So what then what we did is he had it on an audio cassette and we put it inside the box. He put it on his shoulder. My sound man, Bill Barth, put a lavalier mic, a little 
little little mic on his shirt, a radio mic, so it didn't have to have a cord to get to his recorder, to Bill's recorder. And so then we had him walk around the city singing his song, Washington, D.C., you know, with these tracks backing him up. So you hear a little bit of instrumentation. You hear this faint second version of his voice sometimes, but mostly it's him and just doing this really slick version. And it's basically about what a wonderful city it is and what a wonderful black city it is and how that part of the city is in direct sometimes even conflict uh it's in conflict with this white power structure of people from around the country and bureaucrats and police and national guard and everything who rule over this city that's dominated by african americans so they were again themes i had begun in the rizzo film carried forward a little bit in the sun Ra film and then they really fully took flight in the Gil Scott Heron film based around his songs and black history monologues and uh, poems and, uh, and that sort of thing. And then I did some of those same things, uh, well, not as much with the Al Green film, which came next after the Gil Scott Heron. Some of the same techniques, but, you know, that one was about the connections between soul music and gospel and the more traditional Christian spirituality and so forth. But then the Rudin Blades film followed next, and we did a lot of the, the same kinds of things there, taking him and walking him along the Panama Canal, because, of course, he had come from Panama, was a Panama American at the time we were working with him, filming him in a recording studio in L.A. with Linda Ronstadt and filming a concert at SOB's, the club, which stands for Sounds of Brazil in New York and various interviews. Actually, I originally wasn't going to make a film with Ruben Blades. Originally, after making the Gil Scott Heron film and Al Green film for Sun Ra, initially I wanted to do a film with Stephen Sondheim, and he had in workshop a new musical that was going to be called Sunday in the Park with George. Nobody knew how good it would be, but I had a feeling if it was Sondheim, it was going to be pretty great. And initially, he said, yeah, that'll be fine. You can come shoot a making up documentary with Channel 4's backing. Unfortunately, as the rehearsals went on, they decided that, Stephen Sondheim decided that it was going to be, that there was starting to be a little bit of conflict, people having different ideas, and they needed to be able to express honestly what they felt from different sides and then find compromise and he just didn't think they could do that with cameras around so sadly he had to shoot down the project so then well my friend Andy Park this great wonderful hilarious Scotsman who was then the, in the earth first few years of Channel 4's existence he was the commissioning editor for music and it funded the Ghost Cut Heron film then funded the Al Green film and then was ready to fund a third film even though he was on his way out the door, was going to go back to Scotland and work for the BBC there. BBC being the non-profit network, Channel 4 was part of the for-profit British television, even though it was into arts and minority programming of all kinds and all that. But so we briefly thought we'd do a film with Parliament Funkadelic, but it would have been great. And so I, I, I had this 
vision of there was going to be a trilogy of Gil Scott Heron doing black music and politics, then Al Green doing uh, black music and religion, and then Parliament Funkadelic doing black music and celebration. But I don't know. I kept trying to contact them to work it out. And so I had a number of conversations with their manager at the time. And he said, look, If you want to schedule a date in Washington, D.C., which I did for them to come there, do a concert and do interviews and all this other stuff, I said, we can say yes. But you need to know that Parliament Funkadelic over the past year spent a million dollars on cocaine. And if you want to depend on people showing up when you've rented your equipment and paid for some of your uh, camera sound people to travel from other cities and all that, you've spent all this money, then possibly have the band not show up, fine, go ahead. And so Andy Park said, no, we're not doing that. And so what happened was uh, I had been really impressed with Ruben Blades' Buscando America album, which was becoming a real crossover hit with uh, so-called progressive rock stations and all that, as well as the Latin market. So uh, I sent Andy some of the great reviews and everything uh, that had come out for that album, and he finally said yes and that. So it didn't really work as a trip anymore, but it was another film I'm really proud of that dealt with a lot of, including a lot of additional political issues because uh, Ronald Reagan was continuing to muck about Latin America and everything. And so it gave us a vehicle to discuss such things just as the climax of um, the Gil Scott Heron film became Gil's song B movie about the early days of the Reagan administration and everything. And in fact, the way the first time I met with Andy Park in England, I was over there because he was about to show my son Ra film and I decided to use it as my first chance to, to fly to England and see some plays or some concerts, whatever. And when I met with him, they were in their temporary quarters because they hadn't moved into their new headquarters yet. And as I sat down, Andy gave his big, wonderful grin and he had a little turntable in the room and on it he suddenly started playing B-Movie by Gil Scott Heron. And I said, oh yeah, that's that's Gil Scott Heron. They're playing that on the radio back in D.C. And I said, he lives in the D.C. area and I'm temporarily living back with my parents in uh, D.C. after having run out of money and making my son Rob film and fill it. So uh, I think he's great. And Andy said something no one has ever said to me before, which is uh, if somebody could make a film on him, I'd fund the whole thing. And uh, so I raced back to D.C., made contact contact with Gil, put it all together, and then spent much of, not every film I made over the next 10 years, several weren't, but a majority of the films I made between uh, 1982 and 1991 were funded at least partially or in their entirety by uh, by Channel 4, and they really are the ones who gave me a career. That's but I wonderful. guess that's taken us a bit off topic. <laughs> Which is wonderful. That's what we love. The topic that gathers us here, Sun Ra, is omniversal. It encompasses everything (laughs) if you're willing to go along for the ride. You, as an artist and a filmmaker with, what, 37 films? 38? Uh, It's in the neighborhood of 36. A lot of films. You've covered a lot of ground. This is exactly the kind of thing I think that's important to talk about. That's the inspiration of art. I've recently written a couple of manuscripts for books. One of them is about my great-grandfather, who was a German immigrant who came over to the U.S. from Germany in 1870 at uh, the age of 17 and became became a real Horatio Alger figure down in Tampa, Florida, when it was still just a settlement. He moved there and ended up having all these businesses But the core businesses were alcohol related, owning saloons and distillery and wholesale liquor distributors and all that. So he was controversial, even though he was hugely successful. It was the start of major temperance, you know, prohibition efforts throughout the South. So he was controversial for his being the major guy behind alcohol sales and distribution in South Florida. But he was also controversial because, you know, this was basically still Reconstruction when he was starting down there. And Tampa had originally been a fort from which the uh, American military fought the Indians 
and then this it was a confederate fort during the civil war so you still had a lot of people down there that were uh, former confederate officers and everything so there was major major um, as there was throughout the deep south police brutality and prejudice and but my my great grandfather didn't care about any of that so he uh, he made people crazy a lot of the white people because he would hire lots of black people he would go into partnership with them he would build housing for them he built a whole neighborhood a black neighborhood for him in the center of what became Tampa and he forged this sort of business strategy where he would take out he as the local representative of Anheuser Busch would uh, his best friend was uh, as Adolphus Bush who was the president of Anheuser Busch out of St. Louis in those early days so he would take out you had to pay for city state and federal licenses to open saloons so he would take out the licenses he would either buy or build the saloons and then some of them he would turn over to white managers and some of them he would turn over to black managers and they'd have black people working for him as well you know porters and bartenders and all that and so this really pissed a lot of people off because the last thing they wanted was black people whom they were suppressing having access to alcohol so anyway he's a wonderful wonderful figure And so I've written a book about him, which is being considered by one university uh, press. And then I've also written a memoir, which is about the making of what I consider sort of my 25 key music related uh, films. And that's that's sitting with another uh, university press uh, in the Deep South that I'm hoping will uh, agree to uh, to publish it. So uh, that's great news. Yeah. So I tell uh, these stories and a whole lot more about a whole lot of films, but certainly all these we've mentioned today. Well, not the Rizzo film, because it's not strictly speaking music film, but uh, uh, the, all the music films we've mentioned today uh, are, are certainly covered in what I hope will soon be a, uh, a book release. Oh, that's great. I can't wait to read it. And for the benefit of our listeners, it should be said that the Terry Gross interviews that Bob referred to, the very in-depth story about his great-grandfather, many interviews and articles about his vast filmography are all uh, available actually, on robertmuggy.com. Uh, yes, robertmuggy.com. In U-G-G-E. So yeah, that book is going to be called uh, Saloon Man, A German Immigrant Battles the Limits of Liberty, 1870 to 1915. And the other one, the memoir will be called Notes from the Road, The Musical Journeys of Filmmaker Robert Muggy. So hopefully, eventually, they will be available. Excellent. I can't wait to read them. And everybody can go to robertmuggy.com for news about their release, as well as to do some additional research research on all of the things we've been talking about. And even though we have a, a Sun Ra focus here and we've gone off into lots of other areas, we all have lots of different interests. So I would assume that most of our audience would have seen at least a few of your films. They are highly recommended if you enjoy Joyful Noise, Black Wax, Saxophone Colossus, the Ruben Blades film, the Deep Blues film, the Robert Johnson film, what Robert was able to do for Sun Ra and his story filmically, he's able to do for for all of the subjects that he works on, so they're highly recommended. Yes, there are clips from nearly all of my films, video clips, as well as interviews, audio, video, print, all sorts of things on my website, robertmuggy.com. But I also want to point out there's even a few complete films, ones where I'm annoyed that they're not currently in distribution. So like my film Blues Divas, that which is hosted by Morgan Freeman. We shot at Ground Zero Blues Club, Morgan's Club in Clarkston, Mississippi, and which has, you know, Mavis Staples and Irma Thomas and Odetta and Betty Levette and a number of other top female sort of blues or folk blues or rhythm and blues or whatever artists. Also, you mentioned the Robert Johnson film, which is called Hellhounds on My Trail, The Afterlife of Robert Johnson. That complete film is, is on there. Some of these you can't find from the homepage, you have to go to the page that says films page and then look for Blues Divas, look for Helen's on my trail. There's a uh, an Elvin Bishop concert film that I've never actually released, which is on there in its entirety. I think I may have my Rosie Ledette Zydeco film, which was an offshoot of my Zydeco Crossroad film. I think I may have that whole one on there. There's a uh, the Legendary Rhythm and Blues review that's, aside from my two main Blues Cruise films, I also last year edited together all this footage I had from the first one I shot that 
was specifically about this group of blues artists who came together as the legendary rhythm and blues group. So if you go to that website, there's a wealth of stuff to see for free, but then you can just go to like amazon.com or iTunes or other places and there and see a whole lot of the films. In fact, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can see, I think, all the ones of mine that are on the Amazon website, you can see them for free. And if you're not a member, you can still see them very cheaply or you can buy a DVD or Blu-ray. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Many of the films are streaming on Amazon Prime. Several are, are still in print, can be bought physically. Yeah, uh, Joyful Noise is available on a beautiful Blu-ray transfer with bonus features on MVD, still in yeah, print. If you go to the, the homepage, the main page of my website, all the films that are there are the ones that are still available on Blu-ray or uh, DVD. Why has one of the most highly respected saxophone players in the country stayed so many years with Sun Ra? Well, he was the first one to really introduce me in the higher forms of music, you know, past what you might would say, what Bird and Monk and the fellows were doing. I didn't think anybody was ahead of him <laughs> until I met Sun Ra, you know. And I played with him on and off for about six months. And I could read real well. I'd just come out to Army playing solo clarinet, so reading was no problem. Any of the music that he showed me, I could read it pretty well, but I didn't really understand it. I couldn't hear it for about six months. Then one night, I heard it. <laughs> we were playing this number Saturn. I had been playing it for six months every time we worked. But then I really heard the intervals this one night. And I said, my gosh, this man is more stretched out than Monk. It's unbelievable that anybody could write any meaner intervals than Monk or Mingus, you know, but he does. His intervals, knowledge of intervals and harmony, very highly advanced, you know. So when I saw that, I said, well, I think I'll make this to stop, you know, because I had investigated all the musicians as to what they were doing, but I'd never heard Sun Ra, and I never would dream that, you know, anybody could come up to Thelonious Monk in voicings and weird chords and weird rhythms, you know. When I heard him, I said, this is it, you know, for a local cat to find a dude like that around Chicago, like a dream, you know. What year was that? That must have been around about 53 because I got out to Army in 51. It was a couple of years before I met him. So I went with Earl Hines for about uh, four months. Abe Saperstein had a show together, the Harlem Globetrotters. We used to play either before or after they would come to town. We'd play a warm-up show with circus people and trapeze and the whole bitch, you know. Jerome Richardson, Dickie Wells. Uh, Carl Pruitt Bass, all great cats. That's what I did when I first got out to service. I worked with him for about four months. So, Robert, to come full circle and wrap up the story of Joyful Noise, you have all of these interviews, you've got these concerts in the can, you've finally gotten a written contract with Sun Ra to proceed with the film. How much raw material were you working with when you went into your edit, and how did you arrive at that edit? Were there multiple iterations? How much of it was clear in your mind before you hit the editing table, and how much of it took form in the editing process? How did you arrive at the final film? We did shoot, you know, a fair amount of film, but, you know, this was, as I say, this was before I had much greater resources. So I went in knowing that I was going to have to somewhat limit the number of cameras covering things or limit the amount of time we shot and knew that more likely than not, I was going to have to not use complete songs, which just in a Aside, an interesting thing happened after I made that 60-minute film. And then I'll come back to say more about choices made. But um, a, ge a gentleman used to be a collector of music-related, especially jazz-related film clips. Chertok, David Chertok, because when he died, his son Michael Chertok took over for him. And he used to do screenings around the country, sometimes even in Europe, where he'd have programs of like clips of, you know, this is pre-internet. He would have clips of jazz saxophone players, a whole evening of them, or a whole evening of jazz vocalists, or, you know, female blues and jazz vocalists, things like that. So our mutual friend, Bruce Ricker, who was starting to distribute the Sun Ra film for me, played it for David. He got really excited. He begged me to let him 
buy a print of a chunk of it that he could use in some of his shows. And I said, fine. And the first time he watched it, he begged me to do things. He was begging as a, as a collector, of course. So it was in his best interest. But he said, please, from now on, use complete songs in your films. I understand what you were up against in making this one. But, you know, it was better for the shows he was doing. But I also realized in talking with him and thinking more about it that artists weren't weren't creating partial songs. They were creating complete songs that had beginnings, middles, and ends where they did things over time. And to be fair to them, I needed to find ways to be able to give viewers of my films the complete experiences of those songs that they created with the musical and lyrical songs that they told. And so starting with the Gil Scott Heron film, from then on, that's what I did. And it became a whole other challenge because, you know, there are times like in Cool Runnings, the reggae movie, which I made between Black Wax and the Al Green film, shot it at at the Sunsplash Festival in Jamaica. There are two songs in there, one of them by Gil Scott Heron, the version of The Bottle that he did, and another musical youth doing... uh, past the duchy both of those songs are 14 minutes long now you have to even if you've got multiple cameras and i had four cameras at the time which you know gives you options of cutting around from one view to another still you have to really be thinking throughout the filming of these to keep these interesting to make it that you're not watching the same thing all the way through that the song is developing but your approach to it your visual approach to it is not so it became a a really good sort of discipline from then on. With the Sun Ra film, I knew I was going to have lots of pieces of interviews, lots of pieces of uh, music, just as I had with the George Crumb film. And I wanted you to start out the film with a piece of Sun Ra music that would hit you almost totally cold. Yes, I ended up putting a little bit of talk before the first music. But from then on, I would intercut the music, and the live performance, and interviews, rehearsals, um, poetry readings, whatever. The idea being that as you went along, the first time you hear the music, you're hearing it fairly straight and without my editorializing or anything. But the farther you get along, the more these ideas are expressed, which hopefully increase your understanding of what's going on in this music or this poetry, the ideas that are behind all this, so that by the end they come together. In fact, I did this in a much more formalistic way in the George Crumb film. What I did with that one, it used to be the black and white film stock was much cheaper than color film stock. So I said, I think I can do something interesting here. So I shot all the interviews except one tiny little piece with black and white footage and I intercut all those other things, demonstrations of instruments, interview stuff, some other things where Larry McConkey and I went down into West Virginia and filmed some of the West Virginia rural gospel music that had influenced George Crumb as a composer while he was growing up there. Now he was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, teaching composition and was a Pulitzer Prize winning composer internationally known. But um, I decided, okay, we'll do pieces of this one long composition, Vox Belini, which means voice of the whale in Latin, Vox Belini for three masked players. So we had to perform by these three classical musicians wearing facial masks and under blue light because that's how he intended the piece to be performed. So I mostly had it shot in black and white. And so I would intercut portions of the composition chronologically through the film and these interview segments and, you know, he used all these bizarre musical effects and foreign instruments like a nipple gong from Thailand and uh, the use of a chisel on the strings inside the piano, all these things. We would demonstrate those. And then, so you're cutting back and forth. So I was creating a dialectic, as I saw it, between music and life, between the life and the ideas of the composer and this big musical composition of his that put those ideas to work. So I cut back and forth and I tented the 
the interviews and that other stuff green, and I tinted the performance sections blue, just as they were intended to be performed under blue light. But then the last part of the performance, I filmed in full color. And then a few shots with George Crumb out, like walking along a lake near his home in Media, Pennsylvania, and stuff like that. And so then at the end, everything becomes full color. And it's like these earlier collisions between art and life of now, but I know this sounds arty as hell, but it's the way I did it. Uh, They come together in the climax of the film with music and life in full color. So I decided I was never going to be quite that formalistic in my approaches again, but I was using artistic approaches that informed what I did in uh, Sun Ra film, the Al Green film, the Ruben Blades film, the Sonny Rollins film, many of the films that I did from then on. So I knew as we were shooting the Sun Ra film, I would basically be working with fragments, but hopefully I could make them fragments that felt as complete as possible and that would be intercut with other things that would comment on them or contribute to them and that would be developed in other segments later so that you would have almost the sense of of a continuing concert, even though at more than one place, and of a continuing discussion intercut throughout the film. And hopefully, you know, it's one of my shorter films, the Sunrise film, it's only an hour, 60 minutes, but hopefully by the end of that, you'd have some sort of complete picture, some sort of sense of, even if you'd never confronted him before, of who this guy, Sun Ra, is musically, who he is philosophically, who he is in his life as a person dealing with his musicians and so forth. So that was the goal the group of multifaceted goals, I suppose. Oh, that's fascinating. And and it's interesting to hear, you know, some of the perhaps financial and time and resource limitations that you faced balanced with your artistic intent that produced the, you know, the final film. And one of the virtues of it, I think, which is interesting for me to hear that there were practical reasons Mm -hmm. that complemented the artistic choices is that part of what I think makes this film so successful for me and to all of the people that I've shown it to over the years, people that have never, as you said, confronted Sun Ra before, been exposed, but also fans as well, is that, and and this is speaking as a completist, someone who, when they love an artist, they've got to have every record, every tape, every film, every book. And I would love for your film along that idea to be complete performances and there to be a ton of outtake. But part of what makes it work is that fragmentary approach, because I think what it does, in addition to what you said, creating a continuum, a holistic approach, a continuous journey, is that it presents material that to someone new to it can appear to be abrasive and hard to approach. That fragmented delivery makes it very approachable and presents some concepts and some tones that can be hard to take. It presents it in a very gentle and welcoming and understanding manner. So to hear your process is is really interesting. Well well put, and I appreciate it. And uh, yes, I think the way I think of it is, yes, it's a series of fragments but they were always fragments intended to be puzzle pieces. And as you go along, you were accumulating pieces of the puzzle, which hopefully give you, as you say, a relatively complete picture by the end. I should also say in passing with this film and uh, most of my others, that my filmmaking, I've always felt like sort of combined the world of the independent musician with the world of the independent filmmaker. And I think there's a real sort of sympathy or empathy back and forth on the kind of lives we each live for people who are not huge mainstream successes, no matter how highly regarded in how much of the globe, you know, there's a kind of a, uh, an oath of poverty or something. You sort of realize that, okay, if my commitment is this strong, if my commitment as a filmmaker is as strong as Sun Ra's commitment as a, as an artist or a Zydeco artist or Hawaiian artists or jazz artists, you know, 
these are people who often live through feast and famine, but who figure out ways to survive. And uh, in the case of someone like Sun Ra, with, with a whole big band, with uh, avant-garde big band, with core members that he needs to help survive and flourish to the extent possible, and then all kinds of people who kind of come and go, floaters, we might say, who are there for a while, they leave, maybe they come back, they try something else, but they miss, you know, all that they got from that affiliation. You know, there's there's a lot of that with, uh, with filmmakers too. And fortunately, most of my crew people over the years have been able to make a lot more money from more commercial producers and then be able to not sweat it if they make less money with me doing something that they really, really enjoy and care about and are happy to be a part of. You know, my, my memoir is, to, is dedicated to my crews, you know, because they make all things possible without them on times when the money hasn't totally come through and they're willing to wait or never in my entire career did anyone think in terms of being paid overtime or anything like that. If we need to go 12 hours, uh, we go 12 hours and uh, we try to make it up to them other days by shooting less and try to always have great meals of exotic foods uh, that are part of whatever location we're on. And so it becomes a great shared experience and one that we're often sharing with the musicians as well. But that whole notion of um, independent artists who don't have big corporate interests behind them on an ongoing basis, maybe for a project or two, they're lucky enough to get a big record label or I'm lucky enough to get full funding from an international television network or something. But overall, if those aren't there, we still find find ways to work, you know, you make it work. And I appreciate that dedication. And, you know, for those of us who are looking for heart and soul, that's where that can be found often in that kind of work. Just the experience that you're speaking about as a filmmaker and your crews is much the same as the orchestra and the benefit of creating work that makes a better world. And your reward is the enrichment of your heart and soul. So this is really what we're going for as fans that love the work is to be able to get to a place where we're talking about the bigger deeper things. Sun Ra is such a great subject to gather around because it was so potentially all-encompassing, not only in his work, but if someone can hear this conversation, if this leads someone that loves art and is looking for deeper meaning and other artists of intent like yourself to now go off and, you know, maybe they've seen Joyful Noise, maybe they've seen one or two of your other films, but to start exploring not only your filmography, but all all of the subjects that you've covered and maybe all of the sudden become a, a Gil Scott Heron fan or a Hawaiian music fan or a Zydeco fan, that's the goal because we're not into just one thing. There's so many components that make up the art that you make, but also for people that aren't creators, we're not just one thing. We need all of these things to enrich ourselves and to grow. So it's important for me to let you know, not only that I appreciate your time, but that I appreciate your life's work. That's really lovely. Thank you. It's been great fun. Thank you so much, Bob. You too, Christopher. Bye-bye. <laughs> Excerpts of the music of Sun Ra are used with permission of Sun Ra LLC. Copyright 2020, Sun Ra Archive with a K.